Okay, now we're uh, getting to part two here of the Sacred Feminine Goddess. And uh, just want to back it up just a hair and talk to you about this again. There's this uh, stick that they had that shows a woman basically in her boobs, I guess, if you will, standing up. But it also looks like a somewhat of a phallic symbol. But it has markings on it, 9 and 13, which are real important. The 9 is the amount of moons a woman will go through during her gestation period. 13 is the amount of moons in an entire year. And during this one thread that uh, she shows here through her continuity, after seeing all these and lining them all up, which was an incredible feat in itself, um, you can see how this continuity goes from here to here to here and then changes over time into where there are even temples that are made like the Temple of Hathor we talked about and other sacred feminine temples that there are that are shaped and even more look like a sacred feminine temple like a sacred woman's body, the over, oversized woman's body and how that relates to it. Now we're going into animals though and uh, instead of just counting time, there are other aspects of these images and moving through the images of the goddesses we find depicted with animals, particularly birds, lions and cats, cows like Hathor, even snakes and scorpions and stuff. And so you see this bird effigy that's here that I showed you long ago. That's too bright. And in that bird effigy, uh, I've showed you it actually goes back to 30,000 BC uh, drawn on cave walls in red ochre this same symbology of this bird-headed woman and this actually goes back to the idea that the birds uh, were going to take the body that was put up onto a deus and they eat the body and they carry it away up into heaven like the buzzards fly up into heaven and so on and this was the sacred feminine that's attached to that and if you look, it almost has a fallopian type of look to it and shape to it, too, which might have had something to do with it. There are other pictures of art which show a woman probably mixed with a hint of bird, but uh, that also almost looked like it was an animal type of look. There's also old European where a woman's uh, neck elongates, and then they've got this bird beak on them, and they really look like, you know, this, this goose, if you will. So then we actually see mother goose and how this shows up and how this goose and the gander right and how that works together and how the 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 woman is the sacred feminine and how all the chicks follow her and all of that and, and, and other ideas her her breasts become uh, ideas of nourishment her arms appear sometimes as small wings sometimes she wears a mask that looks like a bird's mask other times she has a duck-faced appearance that looks like this, where she's sitting on a crown with her hands on her hips as if she's animated storyteller, and she's yapping away or telling somebody what for. Um, there's uh, ancient owl goddesses, and they greet at the instances of burials that they found, and uh, this ancient goddess of wisdom that's attached with owl goddesses that go all the way through to Inanna in her worship. And you can find them at burial chambers also in Egypt, where she takes full flight as his arms curl around her neck and a beaked head. Later, she becomes the more formal Isis, wearing her hieroglyph on the throne on her head. This is the throne from which all kings ruled in Mesopotamia, and she is Anana or Ishtar, and has large wings. She holds the rod and circle of measurement and wears the horns of consecration on her head or horns of divinity. She is standing on the lions and she is flanked by two owls of wisdom. Right? So you can see this symbology here. Then there's a bow here seated on the throne of geese in the Minoan culture of Crete. And you can see a sacred woman here holding back two animals, and she is the master of beasts also. But these are dogs with wings on them, right? And how whenever you come out to greet the dogs, how they all come up to you and they greet you as being their master and things. This is a calcite carving of Artemis, and she has horns also and is surrounded by winged creatures. The Etruscans give us their version of Artemis 
and in Greece she is called Nike or a winged victory and here we see Aphrodite who rides on her goose this is the idea of the mother goose and the sprouting of fertility springtime and she also holds the sprout of regeneration of the tree of life and new life that comes about in spring here we see on a coin Athena on one side and on the other side her favorite pet which was the owl if anybody is familiar with the old story of the clash of the Titans you see that the uh, the goddess ends up giving her sacred owl Bubo to Poseidon or to uh, Perseus to go with them he's the gift that she gives all of them had to give a gift to help making sure that he made it happen and that was Bubao the owl of wisdom who was armored so uh, the pet owl goddess on the other side and the bird goddess thread begins on the Paleolithic with a simple concept of a woman with a birdish type head and her wings going up holding her arms in the statuary that I showed you shows up in uh, through Europe through the uh, Middle East and even into Egypt in a pre dynastic time and later shows up as being Nike herself highly sophisticated of image uh, shows lions and cats. Uh, Catahulio and Antonio now in Turkey uh, shows the first um, uh, cities and are played with them. And it shows you that she's sitting on a lioness throne playing with a cat. And this is uh, Catahoyak. And you can tell that she's an oversized woman. Uh, shortly later, you find another one where she's sitting on other famous lion thrones. And the first one sitting there is rather a man. They are lionesses instead of lions. And in the land of Canaan, the priestess of Ishtar, necklaces that she has, bearing her image, are shown holding gazelles and snakes while standing on a lion. Gazelles and, gazelles and snakes while standing on a lion in Egypt. The lion goddess Sekhmet is seated on a throne, her smaller counterpart here. And you can see that she is a lion goddess. And the goddess Bast, which is also a female, and she is, has the cunning or the smartness of a cat. Right? She has kittens playing at her feet. She's playing a sistrum or, or a chime, which is very much like a children's rattle. She is simply a cat, complete with earrings sometimes. And so you see it is totally a cat symbol. This also shows up in the Sphinx idea. India, the goddess Durga with ten arms and she is riding on the back of a lion. This lion attacks other creatures such as uh, what looks like in this to be a bull. Masters of uh, them start battling their enemies in Greece. Sibyl continues the tradition of the lion throne but now they appear to have manes and they're turning to a male lion and they have other depictions and everybody's going with male lions instead of the female of it. But a close look into the male and female lions show that the female lions do a lot of the work that does everything, and males are really just a patriarchal seat situation. Hmm. Main cows show one of the earliest pieces of artwork, and here you see a Hathor type goddess with the sun in their head in between their horns that are there, and there's a symbology that goes with that. One of the earliest things, this is that early cave painting I showed you where it showed you the animals here that are horned. And in some reason, out of their legs are made a woman's legs and then a woman's genitalia is shown there. And that's found in France at uh, Chavel Cave, which I just showed you recently in a video here. from It's around 30,000 B.C. And the feminine is entwined with a lioness and a cow. And it's hard to discern whether the cow is... A female or what's going on here since both of them have horns and of course in Mesopotamia the gods and goddesses had horns and this is to symbolize that now of course we take that to be Babylon was bad and because they had horns on their things somehow we slowly turn to an idea of the the devil but if you look up Moses with horns it'll show you a lot of depictions where they show you Moses had horns and indeed in the Bible it says whenever he came down from that mountain he had horns so that instantly says, oh, that puts up a red flag for everybody now. It's like, oh, well, that's got to be the devil. Well, no, it's kind of a deity type situation back in the day. And it really had nothing to do with that. It was a little bit different. But um, if you look, Anana and Ishtar's headdress is adorned 
with divine horns and uh, as her male consorts are in Egypt and Hoffler is represented in two ways as a woman with a headdress of horns which holds the sun or simply has a cow um, the Minoan civilization uh, which I did a video on there displays the same sacred cow the same apis bull if you will and the horns of consecration increasingly horns become associated with male power right although male and females cows have horns in Europe shadows of the horn goddess were reflected in medieval costumes where they still have horned type helmets onto them and horn type heads you can see textiles in the Balkans here and it shows you um, a goose and it shows you the horned lady too along with them still embroidered to this day in designs of ladies of the beast and the horned goddesses that you'll find in just quilt work and patchwork it's something that comes out naturally and uh, snakes and scorpions are also associated with it and here you can see one of the earlier depictions of what is really a swastika and how it comes around to scorpions and what does this have to do well it has to do with Scorpio itself and the turning of the seasons to where Scorpio comes up and uh, the cycling of the years and if you also look in her hand is a cross and in her other hand is a plant and uh, what does this mean well uh, the women had that long flowing hair they showed it there and the plant that's shown there is the re sprig of life and uh, the cross is a symbology that's very much what we have today and it also has to do with the Ankh and things along that line which an Ankh really has more of a womb top even still onto it or if you looked at it from the Carthaginian point of view it is the head of thought that's there and your body standing in the position this lady is here is an Ankh with a rounded head straight arms straight legs right and uh, sh this goddess is shown with a scorpion on her head and she's protecting of the tomb of King Tut so she's one of the ones that are kept from or you'll see a woman made like a uh, sphinx in the scorpion's body and then uh, neck bed and the showing of a snake and sh snake goddesses and showing you vultures and how the vulture is still there in the idea of life and death but no longer are these people putting their people out to be eaten and carried up into the sky in that manner. Now they're mummifying them for posterity, right? And they're putting them with things that they need in the afterlife. And that starts way back at around 30,000 BC. You can find old burials where instead of them keeping the possessions of the man who no longer needs them anymore, definitely gives it to them because he's going someplace. And it's a belief system they've had from way back then not something that came about with just the biblical idea that we have in fact all these ancient people had this similar type concept but you can also see the protection here from the famous snake goddess of the Minoans she's showing her breasts also and holding the snakes in, Cre uh, in Greece you can see Demeter holds snakes for transformation she holds poppies for medicine and wheat for subsistence our symbol for medicine comes from the Greeks and this Cadacius which is twine and serpent snakes and a lot of people looked at this and said this is like the kundalini this is like the sacred chakras this is also like the um, DNA helix that goes up and this is the rod and this is also like the rod or the brazen rod of the serpent that uh, Moses had put up and things like that and you see a lot of these votives and karmic knowledge type things where in early societies Greeks were seen as the symbols of regeneration and healing they renew themselves by shedding their skins and that's reflected in the story of Gilgamesh and how he had eaten the mortality that men couldn't get so it's shown in your Bible is where they didn't eat from the tree of life they ate from the tree of wisdom right and of uh, knowledge of good and evil and so they didn't eat from the tree of life and that's reflected out of the Babylonian concept original that he tried to get immortality but the snake had taken it away and as it slithered away it shed its skin and of course snakes can go months and months without eating and there was a lot of sacredness and wisdom and be wise as serpents and things along that line in ancient times 
Athena wears snakes coiled like ringlets around her neck. Another appears from behind her shield in this depiction that's here. And indeed, Medusa is taken way out of context. And in her first original inclinations, she doesn't have anything to do with snakes coming all out of her head. They said that the, the other goddess had made her ugly. And indeed, perhaps maybe do propaganda, she had twisted things and made her into an ugly creature. Much like the Sumerian idea where they took Inky and made him into a serpent, made him into a bad creature, made him into the devil, whenever Enlil's people tried to take over. Much like that. Another here appears um, where it shows in Gotland where she's trying to get to there, wielding snakes as she sits in a birthing position, ready to look, replenish and rejuvenate this human species. Now the Aztec snake-headed Quetacatl is the mother of the gods and Exjal is the goddess of childbirth and medicine. She wears a snake as a headdress too. And a snake as a headdress is seen with the American Hopewell Indians construction of earthen mound known as the serpent mound. People familiar with I did a video on this. And then she shows this correlation where it marks the summer solstice but in addition from marking the summer solstice pointing up here it actually marks the full moons on each one of these humps to a sacred point that's here right that the people would have been watching and this was marking times for human conception as there was a connection with the southern Aztec neighbors and uh, XL her snake but the meaning of the snake would change and why it was there and so where is that goddess now and you can still find it in a lot of places but where we find it most is well her accoutrement, accoutrements that she carried with her seems to have been transfer, uh, figured into the Madonna in Oxford England Sophia or the goddess of wisdom Sophia the woman which is a proponent of the word philosophia or philosophy that's where philosophia comes from it's the love of wisdom this is in some ways how the Templars got put into trouble here but she's portrayed with the mother here uh, as the mother here she wears a crown and sits on the throne flanked by lionesses holding the sprout of new life up here up top and it's a fleur de lay here that's here which are seen in the ancient Levant area which by the way is a French word also and seen in Sumeria of this fleur de lay and this triple bladed flower and there's a little dove that's lit upon the top of it right and the one thing that you have to say is that Egypt never really portrayed their people as being overweight in any way and Greece followed suit and didn't really do the same even though they had the same concepts and you know there were fat people but they don't show them and they don't show them in their art and they show all these kings as being every one of them is just proper and slender and all these things it's not really the way that it was in fact you can see Humano the guy that's credited with being the architect of the Great Pyramid is a, a very big stout man and he's got a double chin and a little bit of man boobs and everything was depicted as being a little heavy was he even heavier than that in reality perhaps there's a couple more from that earliest dynasties where they show him like that and then from then on they pretty much don't do it it's also reflected in Greece where Hermes Trismegistus says the gods and goddesses and people you see are all just heads their bodies are drawn, drawn to be incredible and to be you know not a hair out of place but this is not a true aspect it's something to aspire to um, you can find this here also where um, now you can see the Madonna and it really recreates something that looks like Osiris and Horus and now the birds have been replaced here with angels and they carry her crown and also as the Immaculate Conception she stands on a crescent moon and uh, meaning the image of the snake has changed which is down here below her feet which she squishes that snake and uh, sprouts the flower and the bird is now a dove which hovers above her head there 
And uh, Ian's beginning of the Black Virgin states that at a time when the Crusades, the original pagan statues were brought back from the East, returning warriors, and they were seen as Madonnas. Maybe the darkness of Artemis, referred to in the darkness of the moon, or the darkness of the earth in it, or it's really a fertility statue. And we know now that the Egyptians also, everyone that, uh, of the queens was there and so on, they had fertility statues that were all done in black. And then they're shown whenever they're dead in black. And this is that ashes to ashes and bring back the life type thing of Osiris, who ironically is always drawn green or blue, although some of those blues were really green and they turned blue over time. And so you can see the multi-breasted goddess here that uh, really is uh, what we know of as El Shaddai, goddess of the breast, or Sabel, or a few other people that it's mentioned as. And you can also see... Um, Osiris here and it's easy to see how the statues of Isis and Horus that are here could easily have been uh, seen as Mary and Jesus and so lastly we see the Madonna and the moon snake that she's standing on and the bird above her head and she's encased in the ultimate symbol of the goddess the vulva even though Mary was relegated to the back of the spiritual bus and uh, the goddess is a fertility figure this is actually the vesica pisces if you will um, if you put two circles and overlap them the overlapping point becomes a point like this which uh, used to be somewhat of an old nasty symbol if you will it's literally just the sacred feminine that there is and she dwells within that standing on the moon on top of the earth with a coiled snake wrapped around it and it shows you the symbolism and the snake symbol symbology goes around the entire outside of it. And that, that symbology was carried on for quite some time until it faded off into the distance. And it took the dark ages to pretty much make that happen. But yeah, like, share, and subscribe, guys. This is, again, part two. If you missed part one, it'll be up there in the corner. Something else will be in the top right. But uh, like if you like it enjoy and share and uh, this is part of what we've been missing perhaps out of this last set of the Bible I've shown you recently that uh, Yahweh had a wife and her name was Asherah and of course uh, Ea Asher Ea is what God says his name was when they meet him and when they meet God he tells them that I was known as El Shaddai I've got a video set coming up on that right here shortly with a Yale scholar and uh, I've kind of been saving it back. I made it a while back and then compiled it recently, but uh, have left it alone. We're kind of going through things in a correct mode. This is one that I wanted to do for a while to show you how much ancient goddess worship and the sacred feminine and this Venus concept was not something that was sparse in any way, but it was all widespread, and each culture made their own little thing out of it. And ironically, their own little thing out of it all was just about the same thing and variations on a theme again from all these ancient proto-indo-european caucasians anyhow like share and subscribe guys enjoy and peace lots more coming